back. Today we're going to be talking about saturation and what saturation is, how that relates to the atmosphere, and what you need to know about it. Now, before we do, if you watched the last lecture, I told you, go get yourself a beverage, some, something liquid, water, soda, whatever. If you haven't done that, please hit pause, go do that. The reason why is because we're going to talk about what's happening in that, that liquid in a few moments. Now, for some of our goals for today, we want to understand what humidity is, what happens to the atmosphere as water evaporates, and then what a saturated atmosphere is, and how temperature affects saturation. So first, let's just quickly talk about what humidity is. Humidity is a, fra a phrase, a term that we simply use for water in the atmosphere. So when you hear the word humidity, just know that it means water in the atmosphere. All right, let's jump in. So there's a few key terms I want you to know about that we covered last time, and we're gonna cover a few more terms in a moment. The terms are evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Now, we also talked a little bit about melting and freezing and sublimation and deposition. Some of those are gonna become important later in the course. But for right now, let's just focus on these three terms. Evaporation, which is going from liquid to gas. Condensation, the opposite, going from gas to liquid. And precipitation, stuff falling from the sky. All right. Fasten your seatbelts, let's jump in. So, remember that glass of liquid that I mentioned? Well, here's my glass of liquid right here. And look at the surface of the liquid. So, if you have a glass of water, it's where the very top of the water is. If you've got a soda, it's where the very top of the soda is. If you've got some other beverage that I won't mention, it's where the very top of it is. Now, let's zoom in and see what's actually happening up here at the top of this surface, at the surface of this liquid. Well, there's actually a few interesting things that are happening. Believe it or not, if you take a look at a molecular level, meaning you zoom in and you look at the individual molecules of that liquid, what you're actually going to see is something pretty interesting happening. At the surface, you're actually going to see water vapor molecules escaping the, the body of water, and you're gonna see some returning to the body of water. The water molecules that are escaping are evaporating, and the water molecules that are returning are condensing. All right? So the ones that are escaping are evaporating. So the ones with these arrows that are pointing away from the water, that's evaporation. The ones that are going back to the water, that's condensation. Now, in a normal, everyday, outside type of environment, usually what you see is the number of evaporating molecules is greater than the number of condensing molecules. We call that net evaporation. So if you ever spilled water on the ground, or if you, you're even looking at the water, the surface of that water or beverage that you have right now, what's actually happening, believe it or not, is there are more water molecules escaping, evaporating, than returning. And that's what's typically happening. If left alone, untouched, eventually what would happen is all the water would evaporate away and it would dry out. It would dry out. Now what you can actually do if you really want to study this and hopefully not in a gross way or anything, you could pour a little bit of water in a cup using a marker, mark the water level, and then over the next few days monitor how the water level changes. What you'll actually see is over time, the water level will lower. Now, don't do this forever because things can grow in the water and get gross and um, don't do that. But 
you can actually watch how the water is actually decreasing in height. The water level is actually decreasing as more water is evaporating. Now, something interesting happens. As this water evaporates, it goes into the atmosphere. That's basically what evaporation is. Water vapor is escaping the body of water and it's entering the atmosphere. So every single time water evaporates, that's one more molecule added to the atmosphere. Well, remember, air has weight. We talked about that the first week, the first module of this class. Air has weight. And the weight of the air is determined by the number of molecules in the air and how much those molecules each weigh. Well, when you add molecules to the atmosphere, you have increased the weight of the air. Hence, you've increased the pressure of the air. So as water evaporates, it increases the pressure of the air. We actually have a fancy name for this. We call it vapor pressure. So the amount of pressure, the amount of weight added to the atmosphere due to evaporation is called vapor pressure. Now, hang on to that term. It's going to become really, really important in about five minutes. Now, so if left unchecked, water would continue evaporating out of this canister. It would continue escaping and escaping and escaping, and it would eventually all evaporate away. Well, let's prevent that from happening. Let's stick a lid on the canister. Well, here's what's going to happen if we stick a lid on the canister. As water evaporates, that's going to increase the pressure of the air just above the water. So if we put a lid on our glass, it increases the pressure, the vapor pressure of the air above the surface of the water. Now think about this. How do you feel when you carry a backpack that's really light outside? That if you're walking around and you have a backpack maybe with just a folder in it. No big deal. But let's say you have the textbook for this class in there and the textbook for your math class and the textbook for your English class and you were also taking back the books that you were selling from last quarter and so you have all those books in your backpack and then you have like your best friend's books in your backpack and so on and so suddenly you have all of this weight in your backpack how are you going to feel walking around with that? you're going to feel weighed down, right? well, the same thing happens in the atmosphere as we put more weight into the atmosphere we're actually weighing down this body of water more. So the more water that evaporates, the heavier this air becomes. As it becomes heavier, it weighs down on the body of water more. This does two things. One, it makes it harder for water molecules to escape. Two, it actually forces more water molecules back down into the water. What this does is it increases condensation. So what's actually happening is as the water evaporates, it forces more condensation to happen. So the more evaporation occurs, the more condensation occurs. Eventually what will happen is the air above the, the water will become so heavy with water vapor that it can't hold any more. It can't hold on to any more. In this case, if even one more molecule of water is absorbed, it is evaporated, that forces another one back down into the water. This is called saturation. So basically what happens is Additional water vapor makes this air heavier, weighing down on the body of water and forcing molecules to return to it. The more evaporation, the more condens condensation. Eventually the two equal each other.
and we get saturation. In this case, we say that the relative humidity of this air is 100%, meaning it has 100% of the water vapor that it can hold. Think about it like a sponge. When the sponge is unsaturated, you could soak more water into it. However, once you saturate the sponge, you, it can't hold any more water. If you add any additional water to it, it just comes right back out. Any additional water you put into the air, it immediately condenses back out. This is what happens in a saturated atmosphere. Now, how does saturation occur, or more specifically, how does temperature affect saturation? Well, think about what happens when you warm water up. The warmer the water becomes, the more evaporation occurs. The warmer the water becomes, the more evaporation occurs. Well, the same thing happens in the atmosphere. The warmer the air becomes, the easier evaporation can happen. And the harder condensation can happen. The harder it is for condensation to happen. So warm air promotes more evaporation and it holds back, it prevents condensation. On the other hand, if you cool the air down, this makes evaporation harder to happen and condensation easier to happen. Putting those two things together brings us to what I consider to be a pretty dirty phrase in meteorology, and I'll explain why in a second. Warm air holds more water vapor than cold air. So the warmer the air, the greater its capacity, the more water vapor it can hold. The colder, the less. Now here's why I call this a dirty phrase. This is why I feel just dirty for even doing it, for even saying it right now, I feel unclean. The reason why I do is because the air is not literally holding the water. Rather, it's just easier for it to evaporate. And since it's easier for it to evaporate, there's no real need for it to condense back down. But to say that it's actually holding the water vapor, it's kind of a stretch. But for the purpose of this class and for the purpose of what we're talking about, it's good enough. But if you end up dating a meteorologist and you end up telling them that warm air holds more water vapor, don't be surprised if they walk out on you. So that brings us to the next concept. So I told you about five minutes ago about something called vapor pressure. Well, let's go back and talk about vapor pressure. So a few weeks ago, we talked about pressure in general. And we said that pressure is the weight of the air above you. Now, the total weight of the air above you is determined by all the different components in the air, such as your weight. Your weight is a total, a sum, of all the different components of you. So it's the components of all your muscle, of all your bones, of your blood, of the oxygen that you're breathing in, also of the clothes that you're wearing, and so on. Each one of these things contributes to your weight. Well, in that manner, each one of the gases in our atmosphere, such as nitrogen, oxygen, helium, argon, carbon dioxide, all of these things each contribute to the mass of our air. Contributes to the mass of our air. Here at sea level, assuming you're watching this at sea level, Nitrogen has a pressure of approximately 780 millibars, making up 78% of the atmosphere. Oxygen has 210 millibars. Argon has about 9. Neon has about 0 0.009, and so on. And so each one of these has a certain amount of pressure that it contributes to the total pressure of the atmosphere. Well, water vapor can make up anywhere between 0 to 4% of what's in our atmosphere, depending on conditions.
depending on those conditions. And therefore, its vapor pressure, the vapor pressure caused by water, can be at most eh, about 40 millibars. Maybe a little bit higher depending on temperature and so on, but at most 40 millibars. Okay? So vapor pressure is simply the weight of the air caused by water vapor. So we're taking everything else out and just focusing on water vapor. That's what vapor pressure is. Now with that said, what is saturation vapor pressure? Well, if vapor pressure is simply the amount of water in the air and the mass that it's caused by, or the weight that's caused by it, saturation vapor pressure is simply the amount of water vapor necessary for air to be saturated. So vapor pressure is how much water is currently in the atmosphere. Saturation vapor pressure is how much water can the atmosphere hold. And saturation vapor pressure is highly dependent on air temperature. The higher the air temperature, the higher the saturation vapor pressure. The lower the air temperature, the lower the saturation vapor pressure. So again, higher temperature, higher saturation vapor pressure. Lower temperature, lower saturation vapor pressure. And so with all of that said, saturation vapor pressure is simply the amount of air or the amount of water that needs to be in the air for it to be saturated. It's just the amount of water vapor needed to make the air saturated. The higher the temperature, the more it takes, the more water vapor it takes to saturate the air. We actually have a graph that we can use to determine what the saturation vapor pressure is. And this graph is calculated using an equation called the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. It's an equation that involves some calculus and in fact even some differential equations. It's a pretty advanced equation, which means I expect you all to know it and have it memorized. I'm kidding. Don't worry. You only need to know what's on this graph. Um, there are two key things you need to know about saturation vapor pressure. The first thing is, as temperature increases, as temperature increases, the saturation vapor pressure also increases. So the more water vapor there needs to be for the air to become saturated. And in fact, I said that really only about 40 millibars, the Atmosphere can only have about 40 millibars of water vapor in it. And that's one of the reasons why when the air is really, really hot, it's usually a lot drier because it has, it's nowhere near saturation. Now the other thing I want you to get from this image is if you actually zoom in over here and take a look at this graph, what you actually see is that air over liquid water needs more moisture, needs more water vapor to be saturated than ice. So saturation vapor pressure is less for ice than it is for liquid water. Now this is going to become important in a few weeks when we talk about what's called the Bergeron process. But for now, just remember that fact. Saturation vapor pressure is greater over liquid than it is over ice. Now, the last thing I'll talk about today is condensation. Now, as I mentioned, condensation occurs when water molecules go from solid to liquid. Now, in order for this to happen, these molecules need to slow down. And they don't just naturally slow down on their own, even as they're losing heat. They don't naturally slow down on their own. Instead, they need to stick to something to slow them down. And the something that they end up sticking to is some kind of non-water molecule. We call these 
condensation nuclei. Condensation nuclei. And there are many possible candidates for condensation nuclei in the atmosphere. Now, as water sticks to this condensation nuclei, it grows. As more water sticks to it, it forms a droplet that becomes larger and larger and larger. And we'll actually talk about how this turns into a raindrop in the next lecture. So, in very clean air, in very clean air, so think about the cleanest, most pristine air that you can imagine. So definitely not here in the city. If you actually look at an area about the size of the tip of your pinky, that air has over 10,000 condensation nuclei. So the atmosphere is not lacking in condensation nuclei. And some of the condensation nuclei, some of the most popular ones, some of the most common ones, include smoke and all the little particulate matter from the smoke, sea salts, dust, and believe it or not, yes, bacteria. Bacteria is actually a common centerpiece of liquid droplets. Kind of crazy when you think about it, how a little piece of bacteria can actually be used as a condensation nuclei, and yet it's very common. Now, the last thing I talk, I'll talk about right now is humidity, and this will kind of segue us into our next lecture. Now, there are several types of humidity, and each one of them describes how much water vapor is in the air. The first type is called absolute humidity. This is simply the mass occupying a given volume. So mass occupying given volume. It's kind of like a density in a way. So how many grams are in a cubic meter of air? Then there's specific humidity. This is a ratio of how much water vapor there is to how much total air there is. So this is measured in grams per kilogram or grams per gram, depending on what you're looking at. Then there's water vapor mixing ratio. This is the ratio of moisture to dry air. But the reality is, is that we're not really going to use these in this class. I'd like you to know what they are, but the main thing I'd like you to know is that absolute humidity, specific humidity, and water vapor mixing ratio all change according to one thing. How much moisture is in the air? That's the only thing that affects them. How much moisture is in the air? Now, this leads us to one other humidity. It's a little more complicated. And yet, it's the one that you see on your phone apps and it's the one that you see on the news. Relative humidity. Relative humidity is actually a ratio of content to capacity. How much moisture is in the air divided by how much moisture the air can hold. So in a sense, it's pressure, vapor pressure divided by saturation vapor pressure. And with that said, it's a little bit more complicated. And the reason why it's a little bit more complicated is because it can change based off of one of two things. Either the amount of water vapor in the air, the, the vapor pressure, or the temperature of the air, which affects the saturation vapor pressure. As such, relative humidity actually has a diurnal cycle, a daily cycle. It actually shifts throughout the day, even though no moisture is added or removed from the atmosphere. Now, we'll talk about that next time. So finish your beverage, take a breather, and then we'll catch up next time. Until then, I'm Terrence Mullins. Thank you for watching this.